So now we're going to look at some things um, that result from intermolecular forces. So surface tension, viscosity, and capillary action. Um, so the existence of solid and liquids is the most important thing that we see as a manifestation of intermolecular forces. But other things are important as well. Um, here we have two photographs that illustrate um, surface tension. Here's a spider web with little tiny droplets of water on it, and each of those is a sphere. It's not forming a long tube of water like it did on the, on the scientists. Oh, we've got little spheres of water. Here is a paper clip floating on the surface of water, which should not work, right? Metal is more dense than water, and metal sinks in water, but here metal is floating on water. But this almost looks like there's a skin on the water. If you imagine a swimming pool with a cover on it, right? Big cover on it. And then if you were to jump onto the cover, would you sink to the bottom of the pool? No. But you'd push the cover down a little bit and kind of make a dent in it, right? So that's kind of what this looks like. The surface tension essentially causes a skin on the water that can support things like paper clips or trout flies. So here's a trout fly. This has a metal hook in it. It's definitely more dense than water, and yet it's floating on the surface. There's little bugs, water skaters, that skate around on the water. How do they do that without sinking? They're staying on top of the surface tension of the water. Surface tension is a tendency of liquids to minimize their surface area. And of course, it can be measured. Um, it's quantified as the energy needed to increase the surface area by a unit amount. So we could measure the surface tension of water as 72.8 millijoules per square meter. So it would take 72.8 millijoules of energy to increase the surface area of the water by a square meter. That's all we're going to do with that. Let's look at a two-dimensional representation of a liquid. We'll pretend these are water molecules. Here in the interior of the, the liquid, this molecule is attracted, if this is water, by hydrogen bonds to six other molecules that are nearby. We're just looking at two dimensions. Up here, this molecule on the surface is only attracted to four because there aren't the two on the other side because we're on the edge of the water, right? So this molecule has less potential energy attractions to other molecules. So this one has higher potential energy than the one in the middle. Okay? Closer to zero, less negative. So we looked at E, um, the potential energy. Okay, so we looked at um, Coulomb's law. The potential energy of attraction is proportional to Q1 times Q2 over R. So the more molecules that it could interact with, the lower its potential energy. So here, this is going to have attraction with six molecules. One on the surface can only be attracted with four molecules. Each of those interactions is giving us a lowered potential energy. So these guys are more stable. The surface area um, is necessary. There has to be an edge to the water somewhere, right? But in order for something to sink into this water, we have to push these apart and cause more molecules to be on the surface and fewer to be on the interior. So if I wanted to increase the surface area, I'd have to you know, push aside and, in, and uh, get in here. And now I've increased the number of molecules that are on the edge. And so that's higher in potential energy. 
we want the lowest surface area. If you want to think of this, it's not exactly an analogy, but just trying to relate this to everyday life. Um, the, the people on the edge here are vulnerable. Um, maybe this is a, a group of people going through the jungle in Africa. And the people on the edge are the ones that could get attacked by the lions and tigers and bears, oh my. Um, the people in the middle are going to be safe because the ones on the outside are going to be picked off first. So nobody wants to be on the outside. And so this is going to minimize the surface area, minimize the number of people that have to be on the outside. Does that make any sense? A sphere is the shape with the smallest surface area to volume ratio. So surface tension is related to intramolecular forces. The surface tension is less when the intramolecular forces are weaker. We see water forming a perfect sphere in outer space here because that's the way it has the smallest surface area. Now, when we think of water dripping down here where there's gravity, water dripping from a faucet, right? You think of a teardrop shape. Why isn't it round? Because gravity is pulling on it. When it breaks loose and falls, it will wobble around a bit, but eventually it will become a sphere until it hits something. When we see these little tiny water droplets here, they're nice little spheres. Any questions? Viscosity is also a property related to intermolecular forces. Viscosity is the resistance of a liquid to flow. The unit used to measure it is a poise, which is a gram per centimeter second. This is how thick a liquid is. If you think about, say, pouring Kool-Aid versus pouring honey, is there a difference? Yeah, there's a big difference. Honey pours very slowly, right? It's very thick. It takes, it just like it moves slow. How does it move so slow? Because it's viscous. The intermolecular forces between its particles are very strong. And so it's like, well, I'm a liquid, I'm moving, but it's just going to take me a while because there's so much Velcro here and it just moves very, very slowly. That's viscosity. <coughs> so stronger intermolecular forces, more viscous, doesn't flow as well. So again, here molecular shape can be important. Long molecules can get tangled up in each other and so they will have more intermolecular attraction to each other and cause higher viscosity than small molecules or round molecules. In this table, we're comparing um, straight chain hydrocarbons. Um, and so we've got pentane through milnane. And all of these form kind of long, squiggly snakes. Right? There's rotation around the single bonds. And so this isn't like a piece of uncooked spaghetti that's just a stiff rod. This is like cooked spaghetti. It can wiggle around. And so these are going to tangle up with each other very well. And these are not going to tangle as well. And so we see that the viscosity increases as the length of the chain increases. Intermolecular forces are also increasing. Viscosity also depends on temperature. What happens to that honey if you heat it up? It burns. <laughs> what if you heat it carefully? It gets, it gets thinner, right? It gets more watery, it pours better. The viscosity goes down. Why is that? Well, at higher temperatures, the thermal energy of those individual molecules partially overcomes those intermolecular forces that are causing it to pour slowly. 
and so they're able to move better because they each have more energy. Here we see a table of uh, viscosity of water at various temperatures from 20 degrees Celsius up to 100. Viscosity goes from 1 down to 0.282. So higher temperature, lower viscosity. This is important in the engine of your car. There are a lot of moving metal parts and they need to be lubricated so that friction doesn't build up. So motor oil is used to lubricate the parts of your engine. Well, you need the motor oil to be thick enough that it'll stay on the parts, that it will coat them and not just run down like water would. But you can't have it too thick because you don't want stuff like peanut butter, right, that's going to cause even more friction. So you need a balance of viscosity. And then to make things more complicated, your engine could be very cold when it first starts up. This morning it was like 43 degrees, right? But then your engine starts up and after it runs a little bit, it gets really hot, hot enough you can burn your hand on it, right? So the temperature change is huge. So you have to have a motor oil that's gonna handle that temperature change. And so that's why there's motor oils with all these different 10W40 and all these different things. They're for different temperatures. Modern motor oils use chemistry in a really cool way. They use polymers. What these polymers do is they coil up at low temperatures, becoming more spherical, so the strength of their intermolecular force is less. And then at high temperatures, they uncoil and spread out and become tangly, increasing their intermolecular forces. And so it moderates the changes in viscosity. So you can have a good viscosity at a, at a wide range of temperatures. Very cool. The last one we'll talk about today is capillary action. This is the ability of a liquid to flow up a narrow tube against the force of gravity. It's one of those things that just seems impossible. So here we have, uh, let's just call it uh, water with red food coloring in it. And we've got several tubes here stuck into them. And this one doesn't look too unusual, um, but you look at these ones as the skinny one. This red liquid has gone all the way up here. No one's sucking on the other end of this. It's open. It's just a tube sitting in the, the red liquid. But the water, the liquid crawls up the tube. That's capillary action. You see this um, if you get a finger prick and they take a little sample of blood, they touch a capillary tube to your blood and your blood just goes, whoop, runs right up the tube. You don't have to train it or anything, it just does that. You don't have to suck on it, you don't have to use a syringe, it's very, very neat, it just does that. There's a combination of two forces. There are cohesive forces and adhesive forces. Cohesive forces are the forces of attraction between the molecules in the liquid and that's what keeps them together as a liquid. Adhesive forces are the attraction between the liquid and the surface of the tube. And so what's happening here is that the water is attracted to the glass tube. And so it begins to crawl up a little bit. And as it does so, the cohesive forces are there. It doesn't want to leave its brothers behind. And so it drags them along for the ride. In a small tube, a very narrow tube, you have a lot of contact with the glass and very little in the middle that doesn't have contact with the glass. In a wide tube, you have contact around the edge, but then you've got this big middle part where the water has no contact with the edge. So there, it doesn't experience any adhesive forces. So it will go higher in a narrow tube. How high it goes depends on what the liquid is. It also depends on the material that the tube is made out of. Any questions? <laughs> Capillary action is um, why we see a meniscus. So we've seen this shape at the top of our burettes, right? We're trying to read the burette and there's this, it almost looks like there's a contact lens floating on there. There's, it's curved because the water is creeping up the side of the glass burette. So <clears throat> this is a concave meniscus. Mercury has a convex meniscus. Instead of going down in the middle, it bulges up in the middle. 
because its cohesive forces are stronger than its adhesive forces. It doesn't really like the glass. It wants to stay together as mercury. Here, the water likes the glass. It's trying to creep up the sides. And the reason it doesn't creep all the way up is because of gravity holding it down. In, um, in glassware made out of glass, you'll always have a meniscus. If you make the, make the graduated cylinder out of plastic, depending on what kind of plastic that you have, you could make a convex meniscus, or you could have no meniscus at all if the water doesn't have much attraction for the plastic. 